programs at UT. He, teach, he actually teaches classes in sport history, sport law, sport and ethics, uh, sport fitness, and gymnastics media. So uh, those are also related to his research interests. So he explores uh, topics in sport law, history, international relations. And he has published several articles in many of the important journals in the field, including the Journal of Sport History, International Journal of the History of Sport, uh, and a couple others. But uh, there's something really exciting about him. He, in 2011, he published a book called Drug Games, the International Olympic Committee and the Politics of Doping, in between 1960 and 2008. So uh, that's pretty cool. And I believe that's the topic that he's going to discuss with us today. So uh, please uh, join me welcoming Dr. Hunch. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, and thank you, Barry, for all the hospitality. Um, it's, it's an interesting world we live in, or, or a small world, I should say. Um, one of your, your really talented faculty members here played a role, although he doesn't know it, in, in the path that my career has taken. Um, Don Kyle um, wrote an article on amateurism in the ancient Olympic Games that was part of my first readings in a freshman seminar that I took at UT. Um, called Ethics and Athletics. So here Don is now listening to me in the audience. What a cool thing. So um, thank you, Don. Um, so today I'll be talking, as we just mentioned, drug games, the international politics of doping. Man, that's a, that's a big topic, so I'll try to, to pare it down to, to something that'll work for here. Um, in terms of, of the book that was just mentioned, I'm, I'm so proud of this. It's a good book, but the the best thing about the book is its cover. Man, isn't that cool? Just gorgeous cover, I love it. Um, so as we get into this, I wanna mention that I'm both a sport historian and a historian of sport. Some of you may ask what, what the difference is. Well, an historian of sport is really concerned about sport itself, what the, um, the history is. A sport historian is someone who studies sport for what it tells you about a bigger picture. So I think sport can tell us something about the larger world. And that's generally, in the main, what I tried to do with this book. So what does the history of doping, the politics of doping, what can it tell us about global political relations was essentially the question I asked. And so I'll be spending the better part of, of today here talking about that. So as we get into it, the 1960s. In the 1960s, something very important happened in terms of international doping policy. Prior to then, doping had, of course, happened. In 1904, an American runner named Thomas Hicks won the marathon at the Olympic Games using a combination of strychnine, rat poison, brandy, and raw eggs. Now, I thought about using that for this talk, but decided that I didn't want to kill myself. Um, so doping has been around since ancient, the ancient times. Um, in 1960, something happened to make policymakers in sport consider the problem in a really new way. Um, a, a writer, do any of you recognize this writer here, this cyclist? Died in the team time trials of that year's Olympic Games in Rome, um, nude Aaron Mark Jensen. Um, he was, the death was ascribed to have been at least partially caused by amphetamine usage. The story went that, and you can go back and look at, at the newspapers of the time, that he had been using amphetamines, had some sort of a vascular problem, fell off his bike, um, fractured his skull, and died soon thereafter. One of the interesting things here, though, and this had a real, as I said, a real impact on policymaking. Um, the first Olympic rules against doping started to come about in the years after his death. But the interesting thing was a Danish scholar and good friend of mine named Werner Moller went back and he looked at the actual um, records, the primary documents, um, at the autopsy report. And there was absolutely nothing about amphetamines there. So the story that he had died of amphetamine usage entirely as we can figure out from what we know from the records is probably not true. Now, I was taking something else, a, a vasodilator, but, but it wasn't amphetamines. 
Nevertheless, the years after his death, over the 1960s, we see increasing attention within the IOC to doping, but very little got done during that period. Until 1968, there wasn't really a strong anti-doping policy or, or really one at all. It didn't go much beyond lots of conversations within the IOC. And um, to look at this stuff, you can't just look at newspapers and you can't just interview people. The best way, I think, for, for historians, or at least the way that I've found most meaningful, to, to really understand uh, the past is, again, to look at the primary records. And so what I did for my honeymoon, I got married in, um, when did I get married? The end of 2005. So for our honeymoon, my wife and I went to, to Switzerland and spent some time in Lausanne where the IOC is headquartered and where it has an archives and museum. So I essentially, sent, I essentially spent my, my honeymoon digging through records in the basement of the IOC in kind of this dungeon-like little deal while my wife, I think, was getting massaged from some Swiss guy in the hotel room. <laughs> Nevertheless, that, that amount of work produced some really interesting documents. And then I went to the USOC in Colorado Springs, uh, Colorado, and, um, and dug through their documents as well. And also the Avery Brundage collection at the University of Illinois. Avery Brundage was the president of the IOC for a good part of the Cold War. So as I dug through these, I started to identify some issues as, as to why conversations were happening, but nothing much was being done. First, of course, just like much of life, people are not always, they don't always care about a particular problem. In the 60s, this was true. Let's take Avery Brundage, for example. He was much more concerned about amateurism than he was about doping. Doping to him was sort of a peripheral problem. Um, the second, scientific difficulty of detecting certain substances in the human body. And this, is, this was a really tricky one. There was no way to find out if somebody had been taking amphetamines at this time by a blood test or um, anabolic steroids, testosterone, um, and so on. So if you couldn't test for it, the thinking went, you can't have a rule against it. The third, and this is starting to get into the stuff that I find really interesting. Political problems are related to the relatively uncoordinated international uh, sports system. And then intertwined with that, Cold War tensions that made state government, national government involvement on doping really reluctant. So the United States Congress, for example, holds hearings uh, today when major athletes get um, busted for steroids like Roger Clemens. At the time, no such thing. Uh, and I'll explain that later as at least partially an outcome of the Cold War. So when I talk about the fourth year, the relatively uncoordinated international sports system. When, um, and I've done it here, when people talk about sport government, governance at the international level, what do they almost immediately think of? So what entity would you say in terms of the Olympic system? What runs it? The International Olympic Committee, exactly, thank you. So that's the immediate thought that comes to mind. But in reality, how many different types of organizations are out there? Well, of course, we have the IOC. If we think of it somewhere at the top, but it's not really the top. It's sort of this interconnected um, network. You also have international federations. So there's an international federation for each individual sport, right? Do you guys know there's an international federation for American football? Um, there are national governing bodies, um, for example, the national federations for each sport. There are the national Olympic committees. Today, there's the Court of Arbitration for Sport. There's the World Anti-Doping Agency. So what I'm trying to say is there's a whole slew of different organizations, okay? Um, the IOC couldn't always do what it wanted. And there were good reasons, at least in the sport government system, at the time as to why it might make sense really to not do much. Um, the first was the cost of testing. So in terms of thinking about the cost of testing, what am I talking about there? So what do you think, the cost of testing? 
Okay, it costs money every time you test somebody. Totally true. Um, each individual test is much more expensive than you would really expect it to be. But there are also other potential costs that might be involved. Um, what happened when Roger Clemens was, um, was caught? What happened? He sued, right? Okay, that was what was going in the minds of Olympic officials in the 60s as well. What happens if we actually catch somebody and they get pissed about it? Well, they might sue us. And um, when we think about a lawsuit, ordinarily we think about, um, okay, what if the other guy wins and I've got to pay damages of some sort? But there are other costs as well. Um, one of the big ones, I, you know, I went to law school. I was not a great lawyer by any, any stretch of the imagination, but in the brief time that I practiced law, my firm billed me out at $500 an hour. Okay? Again, I'm not even a good lawyer. Well, how long does the typical lawsuit run? Two years. Now, is Roger Clemens, did he hire just one lawyer or multiple lawyers? Multiple. multiple lawyers. In order to defend itself, what's the other side have to do? Have multiple lawyers. So when we start thinking about a two-year lawsuit, now, of course, costs are different in the 60s due to inflation uh, as well as other in, uh, industry issues. But the cost can get really out of hand really quickly. And so as a result, the IOC pointed at the international federations and said, you guys should really be in charge of this and therefore bear the costs. While the international federations said, no, the national governing bodies should of course do it or the National Olympic Committee. So everybody pointed at each other and as a result, not much got done. That finally changed, of course, in time for the 68 games, a few tests happened um, and in, both in Grenoble and then in the Summer Games in, in Mexico City. In terms of the bigger picture though, again, I, I'm interested in sort of global politics and what sport can tell us about that. When tests and rules did go into place, they were put into place in a way that would ensure that the sports system would stay in charge of itself. During the 60s, there were, the Council of Europe was thinking about potential rules against doping. France had passed a national um, anti-doping law. There was one other European country that did so as well that's escaping my mind. Um, the sports system was worried about governmental intrusion and has always been worried about governmental intrusion and how to ward it off. And so, as a result, over the years, this started in 68, 67, and has remained at least partially true today, that the sports system developed its own rules, its own administrative structures, and its own enforcement procedures. So the court of arbitration for sport, and so on. In other words, trying to keep governments out of the way. The situation was exacerbated in the 1970s, and I explain this in the book. This was an era of, of increased nationalism in sport. Interesting because the time period was a, a time period of detente at the larger level where there's an easing of tensions at the global scale. But in sport itself, there's a rise in nationalism. We see this most, promise, uh, most prominently with regard to the East German state-sponsored doping program. You guys know about the East German state-sponsored doping program? And I ask this because it's really easy to get lost in, in the Cold War. I had a student a few years ago, and uh, I showed a, a video clip of the 2008 Olympic opening ceremonies. And there was a moment in which George Bush, then president at the time, was sitting next to, to Vladimir, Vladimir Putin. And I wanted to know from the class just how much global knowledge they asked. So I asked, hey, who's that guy next to Bush? And there was a fellow in the back of the classroom who'd been quiet the whole semester, but all of a sudden he was so happy that he finally knew an answer before anybody else. And he blurts out just so excitedly, that's Joseph Stalin. <laughs> <laughs> One of the funniest moments in my life, I hate to embarrass students, so I, 
I didn't call him out. I explained the, the situation, but, but it's really easy to assume knowledge about the past. Most of you guys were born after the Cold War, weren't you? Born after, depends on how you define it, 89 or 91, right? Okay, so East Germany. Germany was split into two during the Cold War. East Germany was within the Soviet satellite system in Eastern Europe. Um, and one of the ways that it could sort of promote itself as a country, it saw as through sport and with drugs as the most immediate way to get there. And so this country, approximately the size and population of Tennessee, started whipping everybody on the Olympic medal tables, would routinely finish second right behind the Soviet Union and most often ahead of the United States. So this tiny country was really good at using drugs to promote its uh, sporting efforts. And to, to give you, and sorry, I just had this on the, the previous slide, um, Heidi Krieger here, in order to, Kruger here, in order to give you a sense of the scale of this, 10,000 East German athletes were involved in the state-sponsored doping program. Um, Kruger was so affected by these, these very strong anabolic steroids that um, it started to play with some gender issues in her mind that it had already been going on, I think. And in the end, she, she decided on a sex change operation, in part because of the gender changes the physiological changes she had been going through as a result of, of, um, of anabolic steroid usage. I'll talk more about East Germany in a little bit when I speak to some of the stuff I'm doing right now. And again, the East Germans really good at doing this. In 76, the 76 Olympic Games, um, there were 1,800 what I label as conventional tests, which really were amphetamine tests. Um, as well as 275 anabolic steroid screens. Eight positives, again, none from East Germany. So the East Germans were really good at switching up their, um, their doping protocols in order to avoid getting caught. And to give you a sense of what was happening on the other side of the Iron Curtain, here in the United States, the United States didn't have a state-sponsored doping program where coaches were handing out anabolic steroids by the handful but they did have a situation in which people were turning a blind eye. There was all sorts of political pressure, especially in the 70s, to keep up with the Soviet Union and East Germany. The United States went through a, a revamping of its uh, Olympic system that culminated with the Amateur Sports Act of 1978. So a lot of, of attention was being paid to how to beat the Soviets. In terms of what was happening, I think it gives you a clue that 23 American competitors tested positive prior to the 76 games. Not one of them was punished or asked to sit aside. They all were allowed to compete in 76. So that gives you a, a sort of clue about what was going on. The 80s, though, this was the turning point. Okay, who is the world record holding sprinter now in the 100 meters? Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt. How awesome was that, by the way, to watch him win? You guys remember that? It was awesome. It was not as awesome as when Ben Johnson set a new world record in the 100 meters in 1988. I remember watching it, and it was spectacular. It was so hyped as a race because here you had Ben Johnson against Carl Lewis, lining up to see who, would the, who was the best, and Ben Johnson just exploded off of the finish line. Um, if you want a good um, starting point to this, there's a good ESPN documentary on this that you might want to check out. They came and interviewed me. I was too chubby to put on TV, though, so I didn't make the final cut. But anyway, a, a fascinating documentary. So the 80s, a turning point. And we'll talk about Ben Johnson more in a minute um, so that you know more than just it was really spectacular. So the beginning of the 80s, these were described by the head of the IOC Medical Commission, Prince Alexander de Merode, as the purest, quote, and unquote, in history. They were not, in the end, the purest in history, as he said, 
um, they were one of the least pure in history. There are some indications that the KGB, you guys know the KGB, the Soviet version of the CIA, had covered up doping and made sure that no positive test came out. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but there at least is some evidence. There were unofficial post-game tests that were conducted by, there, so there were specimens taken, just no positives resulted. Uh, a West German um, sports scientist conducted a series of post-game tests that showed at least 16 gold medalists had been using performance-enhancing drugs. 16 gold medalists. Um, how many do you think overall were using there? Much, much higher number. So, that's the situation in 1980. 1983, we see over time an increasing number of embarrassments that happen. And this causes pressure for reform that culminates in Johnson's test in 88. But 83, another major scandal. At the 83 Pan American Games, a new set of testing mechanisms went into place for testosterone. A new set of more precise machinery was used for the tests, and it resulted in 17 positives. In addition, and this was what most caused the scandal, a whole bunch of athletes just left before their competitions um, in order to not test positive. So we saw 12 American athletes who left early and others deliberately performed poorly because only the medalists were tested. Oh, I, I pulled my hamstring. I'm gonna fall down close to the finish line. Um, I won't test positive that way. In 84, we have another scandal that didn't show up so much in the news as one would have thought, but nevertheless, those insiders knew what was happening. The 84 games, of course, known to be, I don't know what you would call it, the most economically profitable in modern Olympic history. You had a new IOC, relatively new IOC president, Juan Antonio Samarok, who was interested in building the financial integrity of the games. Um, Peter Uberoth, who was in charge of the Olympic venues um, in Los Angeles, was likewise motivated by financial concerns. His background was as a big business runner, operator, um, and again, highly successful in that endeavor. I have letters, though, that Uberoth would write to the IOC saying, the doctors, always the evil bad guys, the doctors, just kidding, are ruining the games because they're costing me too much. The tests that they wanted to use, in his view, were gonna cost too much money and hurt the bottom line. It's not too much of a surprise then that a set of specimens disappeared, of test results, excuse me, disappeared. And there were multiple parties blaming each other. The big point though was that somebody took them and destroyed them, got rid of them. So another scandal ensued. We see these series of scandals. And then of course in 88, Ben Johnson, after setting a new world record, um, failed his steroid test spectacularly. He had multiple stero anabolic steroid indications in his system. So this caused a huge uproar that finally changed things. But I'll mention one more thing about Johnson just because I love this story. It's my favorite story to tell in the entire episode here. At the 87 World Track and Field Championships, this is the year before, Ben Johnson tested positive for a steroid masking agent called probenicid. And his trainer, the guy, the guy on the right here, Charlie Francis, who is a brilliant trainer. There are all sorts of things you can learn from him about training methodology. But he was also, he also made the decision to involve or allow his pupils to use um, performance enhancing drugs. And he explained in 87 this presence of the steroid masking agent probenicid by saying, well, Ben Johnson, he has gonorrhea. So no problem. Okay, well, for you scientists out there, you might know that probenicid has two uses. Um, one, it's a steroid masking agent, meaning you put it in your system and you can't really detect anabolic steroids because it obscures the test results. The second is what happens if you have gonorrhea? You're given penicillin, right? Well, penicillin normally leaks out of the human body really rapidly. 
Probenicid keeps it in the human body for a longer period, so it has time to work. So by saying to the sports officials there that Ben Johnson had gonorrhea, that was accepted as true, and no repercussions happened. So that in 88, he was allowed to run, and again, with the whole world watching, failed spectacularly. So this pushed all sorts of public pressure on the IOC and the other members of the Olympic governance system for reform. This period also, some other things were happening in the international system that I find both interesting and that were meaningful in terms of the future of doping policy. One, you have the dismantling of the East German doping system and a whole slew of documents that came out from that. You had the end of the Cold War. So as I said earlier, the Soviet Union and the United States wanted to beat each other so badly that they were either willing to push for steroids in East Germany or to turn a blind eye like in the United States. Well, that was over. You also had a newfound cooperation between national governments on the subject. National governments, no longer feeling like they had to beat the Soviet Union, for example, all of a sudden saw their reputation as fairness, for fairness, as really important. And therefore, they saw doping by their own athletes as hugely embarrassing in a way that they did not during the Cold War. So they were willing to push for reform. You still, of course, had Juan Antonio Samaran, who was interested in fin financials above all else, so potentially a, a difficulty, and ambiguity in terms of what it actually means. What is the definition of doping? Why are anabolic steroids not allowed, but creatine is, for example? So those are questions that haven't, haven't been resolved. So that Dick Pound, for example, the, uh, the first head of the World Anti-Doping Agency, said at the end of the Cold War, we still have no clearly stated definition of what doping is. This remains a problem, by the way. So all of this pressure ended in 1999, when a, a world conference on doping and sport was held, and produced a new sort of hybrid agency called the World Anti-Doping Agency that was funded 50% by governments in return for 50% of the control. So all of a sudden, we saw this um, era in which the sports system kept everything within itself to a, a period of time in which the government, the governments have interjected themselves. We see this in the United States today in terms of investigative and enforcement partnerships between law enforcement units and anti-doping officials, such as Lance Armstrong in his case. This has produced some, some, I think, real legal issues. Um, for example, in doping cases, the standard has been changed from beyond a reasonable doubt, those of you who are lawyers will know what that means, to comfortable satisfaction. In other words, the, the standard for finding somebody guilty is lower now than it has been in the past. The, there are few evidentiary protections as well, so that, for example, in a real lawsuit, by a U.S. government agency, there are all sorts of protections that we have against illegal searches and seizures, for example. Um, today, there are mechanisms in place where law enforcement authorities can give anti-doping officials their evidence, regardless of how it was collected, and use it against you. I, I have real problems with that in terms of uh, legal philosophy. So we're gonna, we're gonna switch gears here and talk about some of the stuff that I'm doing now. Um, as we, we talked about the Cold War before, and I wanna carry that on a little bit. The Cold War in most people's minds today was a bipolar geopolitical conflict between two uniform blocks, one led by the United States of the Western world, one by the Soviet bloc in the evil empire of Eastern Europe. So good versus evil is the paradigm by which many of us still think about the Cold War. There are problems in terms of studying the Cold War. 
as an historian on the subject of doping, it is really tough to get Soviet records. Um, Russia today has not been incredibly forthcoming about opening up its archival sources. Um, in the literature on the subject, very few archival sources are cited. Um, there is one document that I know of that has made it out of the Soviet Union that has ever been used by an historian. It has been cited in only one English language um, scholarly piece of work, though. So the archival record is really bare. The good news is, if you can't get the Soviet records, you can get the East German records, which are awesome. The East Germans paid attention to everybody. They spied on the Soviets, they spied on America, they spied on Britain, they looked at everybody. And I'm particularly lucky at UT Austin in that a big heap of them have arrived on campus. Um, shortly after I finished my book with the great cover, um, these East German doping documents were donated by a fellow named Stephen Ungerleiter who had written a popular book on the subject, um, donated them to UT. So here on, on campus in Austin, I have post-Cold War legal testimonies by athletes who had been involved uh, in doping in East Germany, as well as the Stasi policy memoranda and informant documents that went along with the East German system. The Stasi, the East German version of the KGB or CIA here in America, ran the doping system in East Germany. So I have all of this. In looking at it though, I had, I had a lot of trouble figuring out what exactly to do with them, just because it was an enormous collection. And so a good buddy of mine, who you'll see here, Paul DeMeo, it's not a, it's a little bit of a bright picture, but Paul is a colleague and very good friend of mine at the University of Stirling in Scotland. Well, Paul comes to visit me at UT regularly. He's coming in October. In fact, he spent a whole semester at UT with me on a Fulbright Fellowship. So when he was here, he read all the documents too and had an equally hard time sort of coming to grips with the scale of everything. And so Paul, um, and again, he's from Scotland, so I'm gonna try and do his accent justice, came up to me and he said this one day at work, oh, Tommy, I know what we need to do. God, that's sad, I even practiced that. <laughs> he had read this University of Illinois study that had just come out that if you have two beers, your creativity is heightened. And so he goes, we need to have two beers. So we went to a, um, he was staying with my wife and I at our house. So we went to a microbrewery um, within walking distance. Now you guys are, most of you are under 21 and you've never had beer. So I'll explain that it really does work. Two beers, your creativity goes up. We had doped ourselves in terms of creativity. So we're sitting there and Paul goes, okay, we've been asking what we can use these for, we should ask what we cannot use them for. My Scottish accent is going downhill. <laughs> this is gonna be on TV, so Paul will make fun of me to no end when he visits in a, in a month or so. Well, it turned out that here we had 200 testimonies from athletes. Well, how many athletes did I say were involved? 10,000. So what can you say using a small fraction of the total voices? So that was our first concern. In addition, they were primarily legal testimonies used in court cases. So those were written or they were created for a particular purpose. And you have to keep those purposes in mind when you, um, when you use them in historical research. So in using these, we came up with two studies that I'll, I'll talk about briefly. Um, first, within the East German historiography, it's said that the East German doping system was made in order to prove socialist superiority against the West, that it was systematic and it was abusive. All of these are true to some extent. So the bipolar nature of the Cold War, Proving socialist superiority, again, this was true. I'll skip through some of the quotes because I'm running a hair low on time because of my long-winded Scottish statements. But in here, we also found little prisms by which we could 
find some contrarian evidence. For example, in Eastern Bloc's uh, sports scientist Ladislav Pataki said the Soviets were, who had defected from Eastern Europe at one point, the Soviets were not at all worried about whether or not they could beat American athletes in international competitions. They were certain they could. What worried them was the growing power of other Eastern Bloc countries. The country that worried them most, however, was East Germany. The Soviets were worried that East Germany would beat them rather than Americans. Now, you can make too much out of this, but I think there's a kernel of truth here. And when we started to look at the East German documents, we found similar little kernels. The party leadership demands first and foremost that the GDR sports system delivers victories, especially at the Olympics, even this, if this has to happen at the expense of the Soviet Union, said the chief medical officer involved in the doping pro program, Manfred Hübner. So, is it totally true that the system was designed to prove so, uh, socialist superiority? Not if you also wanted to beat the Soviets in the manner that they were speaking. So the Soviets worried about this, um, that the GDR success would look really bad given it was within their own satellite system. And some evidence is out there that this played a role in the Soviet decision to boycott the 84 games in Los Angeles. The East Germans had a really good team. The Soviets had a relatively moderate team um, for that year. So worried the East Germans would beat them, played some role in the 84 boycott. So our conclusion was that the GDR doping program was created both for intra-Soviet bloc political reasons <clears throat> as well as to demonstrate socialist superiority, the latter probably being the primary driver. We also decided to look at the medical risk involved in the GDR doping system as it compared to the American system of turning the other cheek. This came about when we found a document, again written by Manfred Hoopner, that when the American sprinter Florence Griffith Joyner beat all of our sprinters in the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, I was accused of not having done everything in my power to give our sprinters the edge. The coaches really wanted to use human growth hormone, but I wouldn't allow it. Okay, this totally evil, medically unethical, which it was, um, individual had turned down a new advance in potential doping technology because he feared it was medically too risky. And we found other indications of this as well. If there was ever a case of non-compliance, um, then the coach was punished. Any deviation from our plans was not authorized. Came from the vice president of the German Gymnastics and Sports Association. There were some um, departures from that, from this, but in the main, the East Germans used one drug, oral terenobol, a, a type of anabolic, or a, a type of anabolic steroid that they knew a whole lot about. They had East German dissertations that had been written on it. They knew as much as they possibly could about this one drug, and they tried to stick just with that. So, and we're almost done, so bear with me another three minutes. So, in terms of this GDR versus American systems, in the GDR, unethical in terms of lack of informed consent, there were major health side effects, there were. Abuse of minors, little gymnasts were given a little blue pill and told, take your vitamin today. It turned out to be an anabolic steroid. <clears throat> At the same time, it was in the main restricted to elite sport and did not percolate down to the high school level. So, for example, in Texas, we've had high school doping. It was medically supervised by physicians and other medical personnel. And again, one main drug that they knew a lot about. If we compare that to the situation in the United States, now again, there are departures from, from this norm, but a lot of athletes got their drugs from black market sources. They couldn't get them from um, 
sort of officially sanctioned sources, so they turn to the black market, in many cases from Mexico. Now, if a black market drug comes to you, you don't know exactly where it's been, whether it's been cut with anything, laced with anything, you have less knowledge about its purity. In addition, athletes self-experimented or relied on anecdotal reports of dosages in a much larger case than was true in East Germany. So there, are, there was a study done in the 80s that um, a large number of athletes who were involved in the study were taking up to 10 different types of anabolic steroids at the t same time with up to 50 times the normally prescribed dosage levels. So much more self-experimentation in America. Uh, excuse me, I was wrong. Uh, so 30% of steroid users were on seven or more types up to 30 times. So wrong on the numbers. Um, and again, evidence at lower and lower levels of sport. So it gives us a glimpse at some of the unfairness that um, in the ways by which we've treated um, doping as an historical event in the Cold War. So that is, that is my talk for the day. Thank you, and I'll take questions. Uh, so the question was, and I'm repeating it so the, the mics get to hear it on the television, um, is there still a huge concern about doping at the Olympic level? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are new and new testing mechanisms that have gone into place. You've heard of the blood passport, which could be revolutionary as a, as a sort of technology for anti-doping. But absolutely, there is major interest. Yeah. Uh, you said in the 70s was kind of when all the testing and stuff got, I guess, more serious. Was there any correlation between that and baseball at the time? Because you don't really see the steroid era until the 90s. Yeah. So the question was that um, we see this huge upsurge in the 70s. And was the same thing happening in baseball? Professional sports here are handled a little bit differently. Um, so, for example, the players' union has to agree to all the doping tests, essentially, through the collective bargaining process. Yeah, doping was happening. I think amphetamines were especially big in baseball. Um, you can read reports of leaded versus unleaded um, water coolers at, uh, in, in baseball. And um, so it was happening. It was less known in the public eye because the collective bargaining agreements essentially kept it out of, in large part, public view. Um, I don't know as much about um, other drugs or rates of usage, but definitely happening. Yeah. What was the involvement of some of the other Western countries during the Cold War? Was there much other involvement? In t involvement in terms of? of in, in terms of doping. Okay. So the question was, um, what was the case in the rest of the Western world? On, uh, on the subject of doping during the Cold War. Yeah, in a lot of cases, more proactive than was the United States. So as I mentioned, France passed an anti-doping law. Italy passed an anti-doping law. Um, the Council of Europe really tried to, to pass something um, and pushed for reform. Um, Canada was probably a little more advanced than we were. So I would say a better record in general than the US um, but you're also talking about a huge number of countries, and things differed vastly um, depending on where you were, if that makes sense. Yes? So I, I got most of what you said. Can you repeat the last quarter of it? Uh, 
Yeah, this is one of the, another one of the quirky things about how the sports system operates, is the sports system doesn't operate by the same rules that the federal government does. And so, yeah, there are statute limitations in terms of what the government can get away with or when they can sue you. Um, whereas in, in sports, has much more leeway to make up the rules on their own. So that has been one of the actions is retroactive punishments. I'm not sure that answers your question, but okay. Yes. The, um, the rest of the, not everybody is tested. So only a, at, at this time, a fraction of the athletes were tested. And it depended on the sport. Most sports, it would have the medalists um, tested. Sorry, I'm spitting for you guys in the first two rows. It's a little like SeaWorld when I talk. But, um, <laughs> so not every member of the Canadian team was tested. Okay. Yes. Yeah, um, I've come around to, I've got a long answer to that. It's a really good question. So the question was, um, what if the athletes, as the NFL athletes have proposed, um, we start regulating things in a way that might actually be beneficial health-wise to athletes while still allowing some doping to happen, right? Okay. I think that... Um, my mind has really changed over the last few years in this respect. Um, I used to be a purist and would say, can't stand doping, it's all bad. Um, today, I think it's a fact of life. It's not going away. And uh, the best we can do is regulate things in a way that best protects the athlete's health. Um, and so I would agree with that sentiment. Now, how you go about putting it together, I'm not sure. But it, in terms of the philosophy of that point, I'd be good with it. Yes. What's your opinion about the idea of separating recreational drug use and performance and drug use? I um you know, UT, my my home institution, is is going through this with some football players right now who have been a number of them kicked off the football team for marijuana usage. Now, marijuana, I'll say that um, I don't see a way that's going to increase your performance in football. <laughs> I, th I think as a, at a societal level, now it might improve your performance in like hand shooting or something. It might keep your hands steadier. Um, but I see no reason why it should be there. And, and that follows my sort of take generally in life. I'm not sure why it's prohibited at all. Um, if you look at what the most dangerous drug is in America, it's by far and away alcohol. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I don't see the point of having recreational uh, drug laws as doping laws. Yes. So the question is, should um, athletes who take cortisol or who have, undergo cortisol injections should be able to play? Um, I think that there's a difference between performance enabling and performance enhancement. Um, I think that cortisol, I'm okay with. Now, others may disagree with me, but that's the best I can offer on that. Thank you all.